Hair Blazers, I am so excited for you to either meet Sue or see her again. We were just chatting before turning on the camera and she was saying that you were the very first Care Blazer to ever come on our channel. And that was two years ago. Two years ago, a little over two years ago. I think it was in the spring. Yeah. yeah. So she got to us when we were just getting started and figuring things out. And here we are two years later. So for people, Sue, who may not know who you are and who you care for. Can you just do an introduction and let us know who you're caring for and how that's going? Sure. So my name is Sue and I am caring for my husband who is 16 and a half years older than me. So that's in his favor in the sense he has a younger caregiver because I know that's not always the case. I retired a year ago this summer, year ago, July, to have more time to be with him because I was working at a university. It was just too difficult. I was pulled in too many directions. So I was able to do that and I'm lucky to have that opportunity. So that since I was here two years ago, he has declined our biggest issue, I think, is communication. It's so difficult to understand what he's trying to tell me. Uh, my daughter, sometimes we both sit there. She's, again, fortunate she lives with us by her choice right now. She's 26. She's here because of her dad and wants to be. We sometimes look at each other and just go, I have no idea what he was saying. And we we go along with it until he goes, am I right? What do you think? And then we're just, sure. You know, we just, it's hard. The communication's hard. And we've also noticed a difference lately of him misusing words. Before he was omitting words. And now he's using the incorrect noun sometimes, which is then confusing because we get off on the wrong track. He gets frustrated that we don't understand him and frustrated. I think that he also doesn't understand us. Mm -hmm. So I have to remind myself to slow down, things like that. Um, he is still dressing himself and showering himself. So very lucky there. He stresses. We took a recent trip. We try to travel when we can. All road trips. I'm in charge, but he worries about where the bathroom is. A hotel room, uh, if we're staying with the family, where's the bathroom? Where's the bathroom? And then we can get onto that later, but that's kind of my fear is what's coming. That's where I am. When he gets frustrated, for example, with the communication and being able to understand you or you understand him, have you found anything that helps? Lately, I have him show me, you know, like, can you show me, you know, take, you know, is it something in the house? Like just a few minutes ago before he left, I was like, he was just, no, over there, the other way behind you, over your head. I'm just over my head. And it was on the countertop. But I said, can you show me? So showing me, he doesn't write clearly anymore. And pictures are hard because he also has macular degeneration. But showing me and we're working through it. And also sometimes I say, I'm sorry, I don't understand you. Let's try again. And we just try to figure it out. Has he ever been evaluated by a speech therapist? He has not. And I, yeah, I, that's one of those things that I sometimes think, has that ship sailed? Or, you know, should we have done that a long time ago? Because it's been an issue for him for quite a long time. So he has not. It might be worth even asking yeah. his doctor if it would be worth it just to help with the, not to restore his speech or, you know, change it, but just to help with the communication strategies to figure out where he really is struggling and yeah. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. I, I, I'll look into that. Yeah. Making notes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then this bathroom, you know, where's the bathroom worried about the bathroom? How do you respond to that? I show him. So when we're in a hotel room, you know, I just make sure I also leave the light on leaving the light on in the bathroom or a nightlight is really helping so far. One night we're at his sister's house and he's been there for I don't know how many decades, right? Same house, same room, same bathroom where we stay. And he didn't know where the bathroom was. So I got up and showed him. But usually if when we arrive, I show him where it is. And then before bed, I remind him where it is and I leave a light on. Mm -hmm. So far, so good. Well, you've been with us for several years. I've seen you come to live classes throughout the two-year period. I know that you done a lot just with, you try to make sure you're staying in touch with friends. Sometimes you're able to get away. You're doing a lot of really great things that I think other caregivers would love to be able to do. And so can you talk about how you're able to do those things? And I realize that some of the things I'll say, people will say, well, I can't do that because, and I get that, but I'll try to share what I do. Yeah. So, Cause I think what we're really interested in too, is like your mindset around it, how you reach out to others, how you overcome any fear of them saying, no, what do you do when you can't make it happen? Like all of yeah. that will be helpful regardless of yeah. other caregivers can or can't do what you're saying. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I think one place I'll start, this happened the other day. So I play pickleball, which is one of my go-tos, which is my getaway time. If you have questions about how I get that, you know, so far he can still stay by himself for like an hour, hour and a half. After that, we're still getting a little nervous and then he go with me and watch. But for now, so many people there say to me, oh gosh, let me know if I can help. Let me know if I can do anything. And I'm just, okay, thanks. I'm thinking, I don't, what can they do? You know, I don't need meals brought to the house and he's not, he doesn't know them. He's not going to let them come stay. But I thought maybe he will, maybe someday I'll ask. So today, for example, to do this interview, I wanted to relax enough and not worry about him walking through. And we have great neighbors across the street who are now, of course, friends across the street, always willing to help. And I called the husband and I said, I've got something I need to do, which is supporting him, the Care Blazer thing. They know about you, of course, and the whole organization. Can you just invite him for a cup of coffee, go for a walk? And he said, absolutely, sure. What time? And when do you want me back? And so I did feel uncomfortable asking, but I thought to myself before I dialed, what's the worst that can happen here? He says he's busy. Like even if his intentions were good, he may be busy. Okay. What's another plan? And realizing that that's okay. He can say no. And just kind of getting over that, you know, that my own nerve is about that. <clears throat> so that's one thing is asking for help you know, accepting health. Yes. I want to point out one really amazing nugget you mentioned. You said you asked the neighbor if he could invite your husband over for coffee or go for a walk. Not mm -hmm. if you could convince your loved one to go get watched by the neighbor. Yeah. That is such an important distinction. Like, that's amazing. I, I don't want anybody to miss that. How do yeah. you know to do that? And I even told my husband, I said, oh, that was Dennis on the phone. They had just gotten back from being out of town. That was Dennis on the phone. He said, yeah, you haven't got had a chance to connect after their vacation. So he wants to see you and get caught up. And oh, my husband ate it up. Loved that. Okay. That is genius. If that is the only thing you take from this interview caregiver, <laughs> like that is the most important thing, but we're going to have so much more here coming up. So Creative. <laughs> thank yeah. you so much for sharing that, Sue. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. I, before we get into like asking for help and things like that, the question that popped into my mind, like you use the example of pickleball and people saying, if there's anything I can do to help, how do they even know you have a loved one with dementia? I think that's the first step. A lot of people might not even share that information. So was that a hard thing for you to share? How do you let people know? Do you pick and choose when to let people know? It's a great question. My background is special education, working with people with disabilities. So my, my take on Alzheimer's is this is part of our bell-shaped curve. This is part of life's trajectory. And I see Alzheimer's as a disability. So for me to be quiet about that is not doing anyone any favors. I think people need to know that there are people with Alzheimer's and people that we know all around us taking care of them. And so my pickleball friends have known for quite a while and they know sometimes I'm not the one to come set up and I'm not the one to take down equipment because I have this window of time and they know that and they respect that they honor it. They also know because I've done the walk to end Al Alzheimer's with the Alzheimer's Association. So, you know, I hit them up for donations, but I also told them why, you know, that I'm a caregiver. I've told them about care blazers. Um, people have come to me with questions now. So I can be an advocate. I see that as part of my role and not hiding it. Like, I don't think there's anything to be embarrassed about here. On the contrary, I need help. And so it kind of benefits me too, you know? Yeah. It's like destigmatizing. Exactly. Condition. And so I have follow-up questions there in terms of like, what do you do when you meet somebody new? Like, do you just blurt this out right away? When does this come up? How does this work for you? I do put it out there pretty early. So I was playing, I'll use the pickleball example again with this woman I don't know very well. And I said, I, this has to be my last game. I have limited time with my husband to be away. He has Alzheimer's. And she said, oh, okay. And they'll often say, oh, I'm sorry. And just, yeah, it's tough. It's a path we're on. You know, I try not to let it like deflect what we're doing. But I'm pretty open about saying my husband has Alzheimer's and I do carry the cards where I go. I do use it. Obviously, doctor's offices are the most obvious, um, but pretty much anywhere in public, if I have a chance to say it out loud when he's not there, I'll say it out loud, but I'm pretty open with it. Can you share just for anybody who's not familiar, the cards you're referring to? Yeah. So Care Blazers um, have cards. Alzheimer's Association also has something similar. 
it's a little card, like a business card. And it says, my partner or companion has dementia. Please be patient or thanks for your patience. I think it says and they may say or do something unexpected, whatever. I'm not sure the wording. And I carry them in like three different places, a pocket, a wallet, a purse, you know, and there's usually a time where I can discreetly hand it to a cashier or you know, wherever it is that we might be a waiter, a waitress, server, I try to carry those with me too. And it's very helpful. What's been your experience when you tell people your loved one has Alzheimer's overall, the type of response you get? So sometimes it's very, you know, it's very brief, like, oh, you know, I'm sorry, or, oh, that must be tough. But often they'll say, oh, my grandmother or, oh, my dad, oh, my brother. And it opens it up for them to have a chance to talk about it too. I see that as part of what I want to do, you know? to support others who have been there or might be going there. Actually, one woman actually shared that she's worried that she might have it. So I'm starting to look for resources for her, you know. Did you ever struggle in the beginning about sharing the diagnosis, concerned about your husband's privacy or what he would want? I talk to a lot of caregivers who that's one of the things that's in the back of their mind. At the very beginning, I think I was concerned about that more because he was more aware and he would deny that he had it. Um, last year's walk, he said, well, that walk's not for me, right? Because I'm getting better. I said, no, it's for my mom. My mom had dementia. I said, well, we're doing it to honor my mom. So I did worry about that now, I think, because he's you know, unfortunately less aware. I think in the big picture of things, the man that I knew would appreciate my advocacy view on this and see it as it's just more people to support him and support us as the man that he was. I think he would get it, not necessarily as the man that he is right now though. I love that. Thank you for sharing. And one of the things that's standing out in your sharing of his diagnosis is that people are more understanding and patient with what your ability, time availability is and what you can do. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Which like, ties in so beautifully to this idea. I know we're going to talk about help. Like, how do you get help? How do you ask for help and do those things? But simply letting people know in some ways is super helpful for you because they know you're not going to be the one to get there early and set up or to take yeah, down. Yeah. 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 And I've also, one of the things I do is I periodically, I have maybe three friends that I meet may almost monthly for breakfast or coffee. And I've started to think what's going to happen when that's not, you know, as easy to do. And it's done getting this easy, but when it's less doable. And I thought I have a front porch, you know, we can have coffee on the front porch. I have a backyard. I have, you know, I'm trying to think of ways ahead of time <laughs> that I can be flexible and still have that time with friends. It won't be the same, won't be getting away in that way. But I think I fear that isolation and I don't want to have those relationships end because I stop seeing those people. They're great friends. I mean, we'd still text and Facebook and, all, and that's great, but you know, it's about that face-to-face. -face. So I want to continue to do that. I love that. That's another huge nugget for anybody watching in terms of how do you adapt as the condition progresses? It's yeah. not that things absolutely have to stop. It might be that they change the frequency yeah. changes, the location changes, those types of things. Yeah. And even my time away for, I go to a meditation group once a week. I have one in-person support group that I go to once a month. And I do see a therapist to help me with all of this, the emotional overload I sometimes experience. And even that, that okay, how am I going to keep going to those things? I thought there's Zoom, you know, thank goodness for Zoom with some of the support groups can be done that way. Yeah. Just thinking of other ways that I can do that. I love that. How do you get that mindset? Like it would be so easy to say, this is just too much. I can't do it all. Something has to give to get sucked into this. It should be easier for me to do these things. And that adds so much stress and frustration. And I see it over and over and over again for so many people. How do you get to the point where you are, where it sounds like you have a really good mind management of you don't go there or you don't stay there long and you stay focused on, well, what can I do? What am I going to do? In all fairness, I do go there. <laughs> there are times where, you know, I get that overwhelm and like, do I want to do this anymore? And can I do this anymore? Right. But those come and go. I'm starting to learn from some from Care Blazers and some from other resources. Of, I can acknowledge that. Yeah, this kind of sucks. This doesn't feel good right now. This isn't fair. Whatever I want to say, then I take a deep breath and say, but this is what it is. I'm not going to back away. I'm not going to back down. I don't know how long this is going to last. So I got to make the best of it for him and for my daughter and for his sons that live an hour and a half away, doing the best we can to make it all 
work for as long as we can. Yeah. It's just, it is mind over matter sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. How do you prioritize your own well being and your own support and help? Because I talk to so many people who that's, that's going to be the thing that gives first. That's going to be the thing they stop doing first. The thing that can help them is the first thing they stop when caregiving gets to be so difficult. How do you manage that? Good question. And I think the bottom line really is if I fall apart, if I stay in bed some days like I want to, what's going to happen? It is It is a lot to carry. I do feel like I'm, you know, the person overseeing other people helping. Like my daughter is amazing, but she works full time. So I really am the primary caregiver, obviously. And then his sons are supportive and appreciative, but I do manage it. If I need to be gone, I need to figure out what's going to happen to make that happen. I just know that if I don't take care of myself, there's going to be nobody to take care of him. This is going to be more of a burden for everybody, myself included, if I fall apart. So it's worth it for me to be stressed sometimes to figure these things out because in the big picture, I'm going to be less stressed than if I just don't do them anymore. I'd be a mess. <laughs> so yeah, it's really important to me. Have you always naturally had that mindset and awareness or did you have to work to come to that realization? I think I've struggled with it in the past, but I think I've never been really, you know, as a parent, we're in that role that sometimes I emotionally would get overwhelmed, but you have to keep going. And what's this two-year-old going to do if I fall apart? So it's similar to that. I think it, it is just a, a practical, I need to keep myself whole and I'm not perfect at it. I don't want anyone to think that I'm sitting here thinking this is easy or I do it perfectly, but I get it in the big picture. And I think overall I'm doing as best I can, you know? I love that. Okay. Now, I know you have some takeaways and notes and things you've thought of that would be helpful for other care blazers to hear. Where would you like to start and what would you like to share? So one of the things that in the classes that I've taken with you, the workbook that you know I have, the things where you say, okay, here's here's what happens. Here's the incident. Here's whatever happens. And then here's your thought about it. And then your related feeling. And there's a very similar story. It's a parable of the first and second arrow. And so the first arrow that hits us in life is suffering. You know, people get sick, people die. There's stuff in life that's hard, right? That's life. The second arrow is the one that I have control over. So when you started telling that, and then I knew this parable too from the Buddha, I thought this is great because I'm learning it now from different resources and hearing it in different places that I am in control. I really am in not always take control, but I am in control of how I respond. That's the thing that helps me in the day-to-day I'm frustrated. I'm angry. That thing helps me more day to day. So the other things I've talked about are, you know, big picture things I can plan and do. But in those moment to moment, I feel myself kind of losing. I go, Sue, you have a choice here. It's amazing. My daughter has learned this too. If I just shut down and go, you're right. I'm sorry I said that, even though I didn't, you know, but he thinks I did. I have that control. And the minute we say we're sorry, he shuts down. It's all better. It's all good. Yeah. But why do I feel like, oh, I have to convince him I didn't say that and do all that. And I'm just like, that gets us nowhere except my, I just keep escalating and then he escalates or takes a dive. Not good for anybody. So it so, really is, that's one of the best teachings I, I use almost every day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love it. It's working every day, whether we realize it or not. And so for mm -hmm. people watching who might not understand part of the formula for change, which is always happening to every human being, whether you realize it or not, is it doesn't matter the situation that life is giving you. Life is always going to give us challenges and obstacles. And in this state, if you're here on this channel, one of the challenges and obstacles will be having a loved one with dementia. But what you think about that, what you think about what they say, what you think about what they do, that is going to impact how you feel and how you show up. And so we can't control all the time what they're saying and doing and what's happening in the world and what your other family members are saying and doing or whether your neighbors are going to help or not. But we always have control over how we're going to show up and think about all of those things. And people who don't recognize that are going through life with lots of resentment and frustration and anger, thinking it's always about that situation, which means they're always going to feel that way because you can't change that situation. Right. So we're talking about changing our thoughts, which is basically that second arrow. That second arrow is going to hit you or not based on what you're thinking about the situation. So that's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And just in case anybody's watching and you're like, I don't understand this, or I want to know more about it. There will be a free resource like the survival guide where I break it all down and you can certainly download that. I think it's the most helpful skill any human being can yeah. learn. 
Across the board, not just for this. Yeah. You know, I have to say that depending on what I think about, it's just the emotions. That's where I struggle a lot is the emotional overwhelm. You mentioned resentment or, you know, whatever. And it doesn't serve any purpose if I can cut that off. And it's different than denying it. I'm not pushing it away. I'm not, you know, there are times I feel like I swallow a lot. You know, during the day, I choose not to speak sometimes because it confuses him. Then I get confused. And so I just don't say anything. So I'm swallowing my thoughts. I might be swallowing emotions now and then. But if I can then talk to a friend or my therapist or whatever, then that's a place where I can share my feelings, but I don't have to have an outburst with him about it. But I try not to just ignore them. That's not good for me either. I love that. Yeah. And agree. You can't ignore it. You can't stuff it. It'll all come back, but it's about acknowledging it, feeling it, processing, moving through it, and then deciding what do I want to do from here? So you're such a beautiful example of that. And the reason you're going to pickleball, your husband's at the neighbors right now, you're able to do all these things is because you're having thoughts that are fueling those feelings and actions that are allowing you to do that. And I think that's what most people unfortunately aren't aware of. So thank you so much for being an amazing example of that. What else do you have that you think would be super important for caregivers to know? I really don't know. I really think that it's the support groups. I guess we haven't really directly mentioned those. I have the care blazers, obviously. And I always dislike when I miss the live here. Like yesterday, I struggled. Like, do I want to share his decline and stuff? I go, I just listened and I learned so much from listening to everyone else. And so some days I talk, some days I listen, you know, but that's just a great group. And then I have the live Alzheimer's Association one is different, but it's also very supportive. And then I have one that's connected to, I don't know, I want to say the teachings of the Buddha, you know, I don't want to get too much of that in, but, um, but that group has a different approach. So I get support in three different ways, you know, so the support groups are great because I do honestly believe even people who say my grandmother had dementia, I'm thinking you weren't probably with your grandma 24 seven. It is totally different. My mom had dementia. She lived in Seattle. I'm in Southern California. I went and stayed with her for a week at a time. It's not 24 seven. So I really don't think people can get it unless they've really been there doing it. And so that's why the support groups for me are invaluable. Yeah. Can you talk about how you use the support group to help you? Because there are some people who will join a support group and then they hear other people who are maybe in stages more advanced and then it freaks them out. Out and makes them scared. And they're like, I don't want to go and hear about this at all. And then there are some people who maybe just don't feel comfortable talking. Like, how do you ensure that when you go to a support group, you're using it in a way that serves you and doesn't add more anxiety? Yeah. Good. Really good question. So when I first started, when he had mild cognitive impairment, but, oh, I got to get ready and I'm going to be in a support group. I went to support group. I think I said this in my two year ago interview. I was like, no way I belonged there. You know, they were way, they looked at me, said, he's still driving? What? You know? (laughs) And I think when I was more ready for it, what I like about it is I'm there for people who were where I was a year or two ago. So that's one thing is it's not just about how, what I can learn, but what can I give? But it's also for those people who are further along, I think in the very early stages, it is kind of hard to hear those, but just know that all the information is going to come in handy and let some of it go. Just let some of it go. Say, you know, I don't need to worry about that right now. And thank goodness. How do I tell the DMV to take my husband's license away? You know, and we'll, we'll have ideas. So I think that we just have to be open and be willing to let some of it go. Like one of the other members now, I used to think our husbands were kind of the same and now he's much more advanced. And I feel like I can be there for her too. Like, even though I'm not there yet, we learn to care about each other in that group. So Mm -hmm. it's there for a lot of reasons. Yeah, Yeah, I love it. It's a place where you can receive some support, but also a place where you can give support. And we know that sometimes just being able to be there for somebody else and support somebody else can actually help us feel better. Yeah. I have one care blazer who's across the country. I've never met her. And she was my go-to last week. I lost my husband for an hour and a half, lost track of him. Who did I call? I called a care blazer. Uh, I didn't call, you know, family member. I didn't call because she would get it and she would help me walk through it and what to do. And it's, it's a blessing to have that group. And I love that, you now have the, the, oh, email the directory. And- Yeah, the directory. What a great idea. Yeah, that's been so much fun. Last night, actually, Dawn sent me a message and she attached a photo of her and Mickey together. She was just like traveling through. She's like, hey, I know it's last minute. I'm going to be passing through your town. No pressure at all, but we're stopping to let the dogs out at the visitor center. And he's like, I'll be right over. And they sent me the (laughs) cutest photo of them together. Just it's like having connection, even if you can't truly take away again, like the challenge or the obstacle, you can't change the dementia, knowing somebody is there for you who gets it is 
amazing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a blessing. So thank you for that. It's it's my pleasure. Honestly, it's so heartwarming. I love it. Any final words or anything you think would be super helpful for caregivers to hear? The other thing that I keep in mind, and it's kind of a hard one is impermanence. You know, the stage he's in now has its difficulties. It's not going to be like that forever. The next stage is going to be hard in a different way. It's not going to last forever. Two years ago when I thought, oh my gosh, it's already been two years and here I am. I'm fine. We're doing fine. We're going to make it. I think just holding on to one day at a time, sometimes one minute at a time, the end of the day comes and I get to go to bed. And I think just, yeah, it's a, it's a hard thought, but nothing lasts forever, the good and the bad, you know? So yeah. I think that's one thing that I sometimes have to remind myself, even though it's a hard thought, you know, everything's temporary and just don't try to do it by yourself. Even if it's long distance us, even if it's call me, email me, text me, even if it's that you don't have a loved one nearby. You don't have a daughter living with you. You don't have a neighbor across the street like I do. Try not to think that so I can't do it. Reach out to us, really. Care Blazers or find someone if it's not us. I love that. That's super helpful because I know right now somebody's thinking I don't have a nice neighbor or I don't have a neighbor or I don't have a therapist nearby or I can't afford a therapist or whatever it is. They're having those thoughts. But your message is you can find help in all kinds of ways. And some of it might start tying back to the beginning of this of just letting people know what situation you're in. Yeah. It's amazing what a text message or a phone call or a Marco Polo video can do. (laughs) So I love that. I love it so much. Sue, as always, I just love having you here in the program. I'm so grateful for your wisdom and always your contributions when we're in the class. Thank you so much. Thank you. Such an inspiration. And most importantly, just thank you for what you're doing for your husband. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So we do, we take those vows seriously, (laughs) right? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so so much, much, Dr. Natalie. My pleasure. All right. A pleasure. Bye. Also, Nico gets a belly rub for every person who subscribes from this video. So if you haven't already, click the red subscribe button. It's totally free. And Nico says, thank you very much.